Well, it is one hour and uh, 44 minutes into the 27th day of March. It is Saturday. And I spent uh, about two and a half hours talking to a student. And let's just get right into this. And it's not just him. They, 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 they all talk about my student. Well, I talk about it because he, the element that we're talking about is something that's common to a lot of people. It's not just him. I'm going to use this. I'm going to cover up my food for a bit. Because it, uh, it's going to take a bit of time to just explain this. It has to do with knowledge and what people know. And this gets into gnosis as well, because gnosis is, it, it, it can, is misphrased. Gnosis is the knowledge beyond knowledge. It's meta-knowledge. Um, meta means beyond. And of the knowledge, because there's a lot of different types of knowledge, of the knowledges of, that are out there, of the no, gnosis, intellectual knowledge is the lowest. It, it, is, it, is, it is knowledge that is simply... Uh, uh, confined to the mind. Typically it's done by reading. It's, it's, it's what you've read. But the thing is, what you read is, again, simply a perspective of what actually occurred. It is not the thing itself. And you're reading somebody's perspective. You're reading, actually, you're reading somebody's experience on what occurred. It's not actually what happened. It's their experience. It's their perspective. Yeah, a large chunk of the students today don't understand this. Well, not as students. Well, students can be at any age. Because it could be all the people who say, well, I've read this. Yeah. But there's more to it. You know, well, I know well, this is where this comes from. And they're talking about, you know, the proto uh, the proto Indo European languages and stuff like that. And they're working off of statistics. They work off of probability. They work off of a number of things, but then they take the probability, they take their mathematics, and turn this assumption, this new understanding, into an absolute saying, this is what it is. They turn it into a certainty. This is, a certainty is what it is. This is what we know. This is a fact. That's a certainty. An assumption is we think we know what this is. We have an idea. You know, there could be other explanations, but, you know. And the thing is, they don't actually provide you with a path into this. Genetics does the same thing when they do the, uh, the, the tracing from the mitochondrial DNA. There's a large... The, the surveys don't always line up with each other. It really depends on how you do the survey in terms of the mitochondrial DNA. You get different results. So you can't actually state that one result is definitive as compared to another because you have two different results. And why you have those two different results doesn't necessarily uh, sort of give you a reason as to why one thing is the way it is. In, in other words, you have a conflict there. Well, why do you have two different uh, 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 traces of DNA? If you're all tracing mitochondrial DNA, it should show you the same path. But it doesn't. That brings up a question, well, why doesn't it? Why doesn't it do this? But a lot of times the questions aren't asked, aren't answered, but they are assumed. You have the assumption of the answer. And a lot of times the assumptions are, well, those are mistakes over there. They're anomalies. Don't bother looking at them. How do you know your stuff isn't an anomaly? But they don't. They take that assumption. They create an assertion out of it. Say, this is where the mitochondrial DNA comes this is who are answering. You are part Italian. This is what they are doing. The, the, the genetic uh, history, a genetic past, who you were partially part of. Well, mm, that's their that's their certainty. They take an assumption, that's all it was, and they make it certain. Here's where you're from. Well, okay, possibly. But they don't explain how that would how that would be how it would get in there, where the history was. Uh, in other words, they're taking the assumption and making it making it a certainty. And just because someone says it is what it is doesn't necessarily mean that's the case. There's often a lot more. Matter of fact, there's often a lot more what we call hidden information 
information that is not publicly available or just generally available that really makes a difference. And I go back to this whole thing uh, that I talked about before. And this is, involves the conspiracy theorists. This involves the people who believe in vaccines, people who don't believe in vaccines. Uh, a number of issues. People simply talk around the issue. They don't actually get into the issue itself because it's too complex. You know, what's going on today? Well, these people are being like that because. Well, okay. I say, and then they, they give me a, a particular statistical reason, or they'll give that, and they'll, you know, they'll say, well, you have a red Dusky-esky, you have a red Dusky-esky. Well, why do you keep bringing up Dusky-esky? Because he wrote everything that's happening today. Well, he wrote this in the 1800s. And the thing is, well, oh, I'll go look at Dusky-esky. They go to look, look at what he's written. To write, <laughs> to read what he's written will take you a minimum of two years. These authors were pro prolific. They wrote a lot. These, these are, were thousand-page books. And so the, the first, they the look at it go, I'm not going to read that. I don't have time to do that. <laughs> so, basically, they're the Rican warriors who do a bit of reading here and there. That's what the conspiracy theorists are. And they don't really delve into the issue at all because uh, they don't have the time and they don't want to spend, uh, you know, two years on one subject. They want to be... And so what happens is they just drop it and they go on with their own made-up views and their own ideas and they take these assumptions and make them into certainties. That's how the argument goes. You take an assumption, you make it into certainty. As long as you win the argument, your certainty rules. But it's still, a, it's still an assumption. You really haven't done anything because the proof never exists. You can't prove the stuff. You can't prove the the assumption because you don't have enough information. the The proof is simply in the assertions themselves. <coughs> Just because you've referenced somebody else, or it's in, in your footnotes, or in your bibliography, assuming you know what that is, doesn't necessarily mean the information you put forward is true. Have you asked yourself the question, how does this person who wrote the stuff that you got the information from that you're quoting or, or, or putting in your paper or in your book that you you know you have the footnotes and bibliography, how do you know what they know was true? That becomes a whole new question and there's no way you can footnote that. In other words, books have a limitation to their knowledge. And so does intellectual experience. So does the intellectual experience. Because it's only based on the reading. To do the intellectual properly, to really go beyond the intellectual into the larger world of gnosis, is you have to have experience. It's not simply about being abstract. And most scientists today don't do that because it's 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 well you you can't get a grant on it. you can't get a multi million dollar grant. Well, well, give me three years to research this, and I'll give you somewhat of an answer because, you know, I can't say anything with any degree of certainty. Well, I said, well, okay, so this, that's the case, since you can't give me with any degree of certainty, we, we can't give you with any degree of certainty any of the money you want. So, of course, you come back with an assertion saying, this is what this is, and I know we're going to find, you know, this is what in the Journal of Science I was saying, reports have to be written that are forward-looking. <laughs> You have to write a forward-looking re research report. No longer the cut and dry, you know, the procedure, the methodology, uh, describing the events, uh, describing your observation, you know, a dry, a dry lab report. No longer that. Now the reports have to be forward-looking. Which means you have to make a lot of fudges, you have to make a lot of assumptions, you have to do your, your calculations so that you do call data fitting, curve fitting, where in other words you take the data that you have and you shape it properly to your assumptions that say, well this is what this is and of course, once you've shaped the data to your assumptions as in the we're getting a third wave, our numbers are predicting a third wave, we're willing to people, I have people reporting who haven't seen anything 
But why? Because these numbers that they're giving us, these wave predictions, are that. They're predictions. They're, they're projections. They're mathematical models that don't meet reality. But it doesn't matter. People still fall along. Did you get your vaccine? Yeah, I got my vaccine. Based on what? Well, you see those numbers over there. You know those numbers are a projection, right? Well, no. How about the case numbers? Are the cases real? No. They're projections. They'll tell you that if you go back into the background reading, to bother to go beyond the headline, you'll find they're projections. They're not real numbers. But we know they're real. They're, they're certain. The assumption becomes the... the the assumption becomes the uh, uh, certainty because of the assertions they're making. Not because of any degree of reality. They're simply telling you so in a more form. Well, if you don't, uh, we're going to fine you. We're going to shut down your business. We're going to close your church. A little bit of what we call outside-the-box persuasion makes an assumption a certainty. Well, this is kind of another occurrence, is that uh, as you're sitting around, right now I'm watch, doing my YouTube stroll, uh, I was at uh, Yaya Vlogs, went over It's Our Life, I'm um, just finishing up now here at uh, uh, our, fam our Family Nest, and uh, heading on over to... Uh, you know, family five logs. And I was always thinking of going on, mulling over my mind the things I was talking about. Uh, well, I spent a two hour discussion with my uh, student. Is that there is, it really is, in some ways, a generation gap, but it is more, than, more significant than that. In that knowledge comes in in a fractional perspective. And the fractional knowledge cannot be proven. Because it comes in fractionally. You, there is no one hole to point to to say, okay, this is a, how you see this. And you try to bring in an analogy, but again, the analogy just kind of goes over the person's head because it's way outside their experience. So if you don't have the experience, you're not going to be able to understand the analogy or the example. you phrase things matters. And I've been thinking for the last hour or so, because uh, I did have a, an, an interrupt uh, from our last uh, segment, which was only like a minute or so. And, uh, but I've been sort of thinking about things the whole time. And two terms come to mind. Convergent and divergent. Convergent are the things that come together, and divergent are the things that separate. And cultures and knowledge can be one of these things. Or examples of convergent and divergent. And what we typically call or identify as a generation gap is a divergence to a point where one has no sense of reality in the other and is cannot uh, understand the other uh, one would say it in reverse and other uh, an adult an adult can't understand a team because uh, the, the the adult is no longer a team but that's not necessarily true uh, the better way to phrase it is that the team doesn't understand the adult because the teen, in terms of the sense of divergence, uh, is so far separated because they've never been an adult. If you don't, if you're never, if you've never been something, then that stands outside the term convergent and divergent, uh, and you no longer have experience there. So there's no way to connect because that lack of experience is there. An adult has been a teen. Many cases they forget, but the thing is, large chunk, large chunk of the time, the feeling is still there. It's just what happens is that the a teen is now an adult, and 
has the view of an adult because they have the experience of the adult that the teen doesn't have. But typically we call that a generation gap, but it's not necessarily a generation gap. It's more of the issue of divergent and convergent experiences. <clears throat> the, the experience of the ad adult is so diverged from the teen that the teen uh, or the adult has a hard time fathoming why the teen would choose to do what they do because they've already gone through it. They've gone through and they, but they never particularly chose that or, or, or remember choosing what they chose or why they chose what they chose. And so, therefore, they're at a loss, they're at a preponderance. Or there may be other circumstances in the background that they're simply not willing to discuss or ready to discuss or even willing to face. Uh, this occurs also with culture, uh, in history, in languages. Uh, languages uh, converge and diverge. Uh, one would think uh, that the Swedish, the uh, where your blondes come from, uh, that this is uh, this was blonde hair. That 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 the blondes came out of Sweden. Uh, that they were there, along inside the uh, we we'll call the, uh, the the northern part of Gaul. That's where uh, Germany and France were, uh, are, uh, to a certain degree. That's England as well. Scotland, uh, Ireland has it. Then you also have the redheads in there. Uh, but uh, what would be puzzled, and again, this is talking about going getting to, 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 uh, to convergent and divergent uh, uh, aspects of things. What would not expectedly call, call a blonde person Asian? Because the experience is so far removed from this. And so when you talk about blondes being Asians, or part of the Asian sphere, or part of the pan-Asian sphere, well, I can say, you're crazy. That's not, that's, that's, that's not reality. It's, but it's not current reality. It's not until you bring into your experience the uh, finding of Amazon's uh, blonde warriors in the Gobi Desert, and the Gobi Desert is in China, and they found these, because uh, the this is the way the desert climate is, they found these uh, uh, perfectly preserved uh, warriors. They were female warriors. They were blonde, tall. They were your Amazons. They were in the Gobi Desert. This is where they found a large chunk of this, a, a large number of, uh, of blonde mummies. And they were blonde, they were female. And we know from, from the Greeks from the, that, that they always had this, 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 his, this history the mythology of the blonde, of the blonde, uh, blonde warriors, the, known as the Amazons. So we have a company <laughs> now. Ironically enough, Jeff Be uh, 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 Jeff Bezos, he's Greek. So the way the name Amazon isn't a mistake. It's part of. He's not you know South American. He's talking about Amazons. He's talking about the Greek mythology of the A Amazon warriors. Uh, and so, <laughs> but he would never think of them as being Chinese. Yet the mummies are found in the Gobi Desert, and that's where and that's in China. So, uh, but the thing is, it, it, is it the difference between uh, divergent and convergent is that you, because this is outside the standard experience or the standard knowledge, unless you knew this and saw the research on this, uh, it wouldn't be part of your understanding. And there's no way to connect to it because it's so far outside of the standard experience, the standard knowledge, that this, you know, it would be, well, that sounds so weird. And this is the hard, the hard part when you're having a conversation with somebody. And I've got uh, 30 years worth of research experience. And you're trying to explain to a student a concept. And they're coming back with a modern example but you're talking about the 1930s. There's no way for them to get back to the 1930s. And this is where a large chunk of the time you'll hear, well, I wasn't born yet. And that's because of another disconnect. A large chunk of the students today, and this is from the 1990s on, have no concept of history. They don't, you know, you tell them, well, they, they, they talk about a particular concept. Well, the whole, the whole concept is in Dostoevsky. Go read Dostoevsky. And you tell them, of course, you know, once you do your basic study in Dostoevsky, reading the work, it's going to take about two years worth of reading. 
and this is where you, you know this is where you sort of uh, uh, stumble and stump a conspiracy theorist or even a liberal is because once you get into Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky does take a long time to read. It takes about two years just to do your basic perusal. The, ba the basic go through is about two years. But he does describe a lot of the situation that's, that's going on. You can start seeing the parallels. But if you haven't read anything of Dostoevsky, and he was in the 1800s, then you're not going to understand anything. And then you're going to have that disconnect, that, 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 that experience of Dostoevsky is going to be outside of your experience, significantly outside, uh, significantly so, that you have no way to connect to it. So a person who talks about Dostoevsky, you're not going to understand. There's not going to be a connection uh, between the two because uh, the person simply doesn't understand. There's no way for the person to understand. And this is where in certain cases that the conversation goes nowhere and just sort of, there is no discussion after that. There's nothing to say because certain experiences are so beyond the person you're talking to, there's no way to describe it. There's no way to bring it in. And it's not a simple proof of go read this as and it's one tiny little phrase or a headline or whatever. It's something deep. I mean, in order to stand, understand virology, you need three components. You need organic chemistry. You need quantum physics. And, of course, virology. The vir virology is a sub-branch of quantum physics and organic chemistry. But that's not the way people, that's not the way it's presented. Virology comes in from the perspective of microbiology. It's a, for, a form of biology. But the reality is in terms of how the structure works and what the mechanisms are, is quantum physics and organic chemistry. Yet I see none of that in the discussions today. The current discussions of anything doing into, to do with viruses and virology have nothing to do with what the actual subject is. They're talking around it. And this is, again, the example of convergent and divergent uh, thoughts, experiences, and knowledge. And there's no way, unless a person sat down and studied quantum mechanics or quantum physics uh, uh, and uh, organic chemistry, that a person will have an understanding of virology. A person who has quantum physics and, and, and uh, organic chemistry, I do that, have that, look, oh, you see virologist, quantum physics, and that's virology. You understand the mechanism because you, you see the, actual underlo the underlying mechanism is organic chemistry and quantum mechanics. In order to understand uh, organic chemistry, you need quantum mechanics because uh, organic chemistry is the chemistry of large molecules, it's the, the hydrocarbon molecule. These are typically long-chain molecules. And in order to understand how they assemble, you need quantum mechanics. So it becomes basically a form, if you want to lump everything together, it becomes a form of macromolecular physics. Large size uh, molecule physics. So molecular physics, but you use the term macro because these are large molecules. And that's DNA, RNA. Uh, these are proteins, uh, carbohydrates, triglycerides. These are all macro molecules. And so you can apply macromolecular physics to this, because that's what it is. Even though it's not necessarily presented as such. Anyways, these are the thoughts. Uh, it's now 4 o'clock in the morning. My eyes are blurry, so I'm going to try to finish up a little bit and uh, head on back to bed, because this, this is the uh, brain work of the day, and uh, uh, I'll talk more about the other experiences tomorrow, probably in a late night vlog uh, downstairs in my basement again uh, but uh, yeah things are moving along but I'm not going to continue I have a tendency to do this to add in something at the end 